Okay, so here we are. We finished up our uh, three-week-long study on um, the rapture and the timing of the rapture. And so we looked at that at length. So now we're back in the book of Acts. And we're going to look at just um, Acts chapter 12 tonight. Acts chapter 12 isn't really long, but it's it's thematic. I think it, you know, I, I know some other Bible teachers like Jay Lerner McGee, you know, he would string together 12 and 13 and all of that. But I think that... Um, the takeaway theme of Acts chapter 12 is the idea that martyrdom is the ultimate price for those who become followers of Christ. That the Bible promises great rewards and benefits down the line. When we get to heaven, we're gonna we're gonna see some wonderful and exciting times. But in the meantime, we're in the middle of what I've you know characterized before, having a retired military person in our in our little fellowship. I, I've, I've suggested many times that we are soldiers and we are at war. And in a war, the soldiers oftentimes get injured, sometimes they get killed in action. And so that's the great and the ultimate glory for a soldier of Christ is to die on the field of battle and get killed in action. KIA, as, as you guys would call it, right, Genevieve? Yes, sir. So that's kind of what we're looking at tonight in Acts chapter 12. Um, so We'll start out with uh, Steve opening us up in a, a quick word of prayer and then taking it from there. Lord God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the, and the, and the great debt that he paid for us all. Lord, I pray that we'll clear this time away and, 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 and Lord, you know, appreciate the fact that you want fellowship with us, Lord, not to just, you know, that we get together just to be getting together, but that it's, it's your request, it's your desire that we would have fellowship with you and with also with the, uh, with the brethren. So, Thank you for this little house church. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we pray that we all, you know, able to, you know, better understand scripture so we can go out and be able to explain to us when we get the opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Steve, if you would do us the honor, go ahead and start us out and look at verses one and two for us. Okay. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Wow, so that's, that's a big deal there. It says, you know, King Herod. Now, this King Herod that we're talking about, there are three different King Herods that I mentioned in the New Testament. So this is Herod Agrippa. This is the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the king of Judea, who was really a Roman puppet that was appointed and given the title uh, King of the Jews, even though he was... Uh, you know, uh, only partially Jewish, you know, like there, there was uh, the problem with, with the Samaritans not being full-blooded Jews, so there was a division amongst them. So King Herod wasn't a Jew either. He was appointed, he's Idumean, I believe it was, he was appointed by the, the Roman government to keep the order over the Jewish people. And so what we find out then is that there was Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one who declared the decree to kill all the male childs up to two years of age um, because he had found out through the Magi, through his wise men, that the Messiah was supposed to be born when the sign of the star in the sky um, uh, would appear. And so he was like, oh, there's a sign in the sky. What does that mean? So that's supposed to harbinge the birth of the Messiah. And he's like, oh, there's not going to be any other Messiahs in, in, in our land. You know, in this land, there's going to only be one king, and that king is going to be me. And so Herod the Great uh, declared that all of the children up to, I think it was uh, two years of age, um, or was it three? Was it three? Uh, two. Uh, two, yeah. Two. Uh, up to, up, sorry. Two. I yeah. remember it was uh -huh. two because two. Of babies, yeah. Okay, and so all those children were killed while Jesus was spirited out of uh, Judea by his parents into the land of Egypt until Herod the Great, you know, was struck dead by God, you know, and, uh, you know, he had, he had a, a, a terrible demise as well. Um, and so then we see after that comes the uh, nephew of, uh, or the uncle of Herod Agrippa, who is uh, Herod, uh, who was the king who was uh, ruling over Judea during Jesus' earthly ministry. So you remember when Jesus was taking the Pilate, initially, 
uh, John chapter 18 and 19. Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with him, didn't want to put him to death. He said, wait, he's from Nazareth. So, shoot, that's, that's King Herod's territory. Edomia and, and northern Israel. Send him to King Herod. And so King Herod was the one that mocked him and said, hey, I've heard all kinds of things about you. Perform a magic trick for me. Can you, can you walk on water or can you turn water into wine? Come on, do something. And Jesus wouldn't even respond to him. At least Pilate, he tried to reason with and gave the truth to. He wouldn't even address King Herod. He just, he had such disdain for him. He just ignored him. And he had said to his disciples uh, a year earlier, he said, you go and tell that fox, referring to Herod, mm -hmm. that, because Herod's asking questions about you, so you go tell that fox that. Today and tomorrow I do miracles and raise the dead. And the third day I will be perfected, predicting that he would be put to death and rise again the third day. So that's the second here that's referred to. And now this guy, who Jesus refused to even acknowledge during the trial, he put Jesus on trial and then sent him back to Pilate. Um, after he wouldn't perform any magic tricks, he was like, ah, get him out of here. You know, what, what fun is he? You know, he won't do any party favors for me. Um, and so the nephew of that guy is Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa ended up being really good friends with uh, a Roman uh, politician who eventually became Caesar, a guy by the name of Caligula, who was a sociopathic yeah, right. yeah. sexual degenerate. And they had wee buddies. And so the buddies back in the, you know, the Roman Academy or whatever. And when Caligula uh, sort of murdered his way to the, to the Roman throne, he appointed his buddy Herod Agrippa to become the new uh, king of Judea and expanded his power to include all of what what's now called Palestine or whatever, but really back in the day it wasn't called Palestine. But you may see that in notes and comments and some of your Bible commentaries. It was really Judea and Samaria, that area. Uh, Herod Agrippa was given an expanded territory, and when his uncle, who was still alive at the time, demanded uh, also an increase of his power. He was deposed altogether by Caligula, and the power and authority was then given over to Herod Agrippa, who is the Herod who takes James, the brother of John, into custody in verse 1 of Acts chapter 12 and kills him. So, with Steve Reed, I mean, it's, it's shocking. It says now it's about the time of Herod the king stretched out his hand to do what? To harass the church. And then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He's, you know, swore to him to death. And so I say all that to lay the foundation for what I believe is, is the overarching theme of this chapter, that death and sacrifice and martyrdom is part of the price that you pay if you keep in mind that Satan is the god of this world and not Jesus, and he will continue to be until the conclusion of the 70th week of Daniel, when Jesus will come back from heaven with the church at the second coming, at the conclusion of the rapture. And we kind of can look at our timeline chart there. And uh, what we see then is that the 70th week of Daniel will be Satan's time to rule here on the planet Earth. And he'll reign through the person of the individual known as the Antichrist. And God will start bringing down his wrath on the kingdom of the Antichrist and on those who rejected his son Jesus. Which is why we talked last week and two weeks prior to that, that the church has to be raptured out. The church will be raptured out because God's wrath will come down on those who rejected his son. And since we didn't reject his son, we wouldn't need to go through this period of wrath of God, which is the great tribulation period. Not just tribulation, the church is already being you know, exposed to tribulation, as we can see uh, clearly in verses 1 and 2, when, you know, James gets uh, taken into custody just to harass the church. Not because he did anything specifically, but because he was a member of the church. And to harass them, it's like, hey, let's kill one of their head guys. So Jesus will come back at the conclusion of the 70th week of Daniel, and then he will put to rest the reign of Satan, the god of this world, who received his his leadership authority from Adam in Genesis chapter 3 by bowing the knee to his wife, he handed over the lordship of the planet earth to a megalomaniacal genocidal maniac, Satan. And that will be his control until the end of that 70th week when Jesus will come back to begin the millennial reign of Christ on earth. Till that time, 
the church is now under the persecution, under the watchful eye of the God of this world, Satan. <clears throat> and since Satan is the God of this world and controls all the kingdoms of the world, when he sees us, it infuriates him. What's it do? Because it reminds him that the judgment of God is coming soon. And he doesn't like thinking about that. And whenever he sees one of us, it reminds him that his judgment is coming, right? And it's going to be bad. So he gets angry when he sees me coming, or he sees Steve coming, or he sees Genevieve coming. And he does mean things to hurt us. And I'm convinced, like today, it had to be one of the most trying days in the history of my life on the planet Earth. I was in the kitchen like, Lord, I'm going to pull my hair out and jump out of the window because it's been a crazy day. It's just one of, one of those days. And then I remember, oh, yeah, I teach the Bible study. Like, yeah, you know, all this stuff always happens on Thursday before I'm teaching. Always. And it's been that way for years. Whenever I got to teach, clients will start calling, I need this, I need that, blah, 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 blah. You know, distracting things happen repeatedly when it's Thursday night to prepare. Time to prepare for the Bible study and then time to go out and teach it. So it's par for the course because Satan sees us and he knows us. And he's aware that we have impact in the kingdom of the world and the impact we have is powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so we have to keep that in mind. When we look at the example we see in scripture, we see that it's not all you know butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns sure. in the Bible. If you become a follower of Jesus, you now have a target placed on your chest, boom. And you know, you got sharpshooters from the kingdom of darkness that are taking shots at you. And if shots aren't being taken at you, that might be because you're not enough of a threat for Satan to pay attention to you yet. But you're, you should aspire to be in the line of fire for Satan because he wants to destroy you. The Bible says he's come not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. And he wants to destroy us. And so what, what I thought I'd emphasize tonight is, yeah, the, the cost of following Christ, he... You know, people talk about easy believism. Oh, all you gotta do is say the sinner's prayer, and once you're born again, you can go out and commit any sins you want. And I'm saying to people that, look, the idea that once saved, always saved is not biblical is a satanic attack on the gospel of Jesus Christ and on the efficacy of his blood. And I see so many YouTube videos now. YouTube has just become poisoned mm -hmm. with false Christianity. If it's not attacking the rapture, by these so-called Christian YouTubers and they're attacking once saved, always saved. And I see the uh, OS, AS, and I was like, what is that? And, you know, I was like, oh, it's the doctrine of once saved, always saved. You know, the only doctrine more attacked than once saved, always saved is the doctrine of the rapture. And so those two things seem to make Satan the most upset. And so he raises up these counterfeit YouTube Christian people that set up pages and they attack those two things. If you believe that once saved, always saved is not biblical, what you're in essence saying is that you have to participate in your own salvation by doing good works. If you don't do enough good works, then you lose the salvation that was purchased for you by Jesus. Jesus can save you, as the Jehovah's Witnesses tried to explain to me, but you have to keep yourself saved by doing good works and pleasing Jehovah. And so that's not the Bible, and that discounts the legitimacy and the efficacy of Jesus' death on the cross. And so we're going to now look at what it really means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean that you can say a magic mantra and then you can go to strip clubs and mm -hmm. be your neighbor's wife, engage in homosexuality, you know, steal, kill, and destroy all you want. And God can't do anything to you because you're already saved and you're going to go to heaven. So you have no motivation to live right or live righteously. That's not true either because you do have a motivation because you want rewards in heaven. So we see clearly that the Bible talks about rewards that will be given out to us at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ for the church. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 10, at the marriage feast of the Lamb, the church will be given rewards in heaven for all the good stuff it did for the Lord and for his cause here on the earth. If we didn't do any good things, then we aren't going to have any rewards to show for it up there. If you did bad things, the Lord might even cut short your physical life. I wouldn't mind the Lord cutting my food life short because I'm ready to go, just to be, to be honest with you. But he, he, he stubbornly refuses to accept my offer to resign. I've offered him to resign. 
the leadership of South Beach Gospel <laughs> Church and turn over the evangelism what program to me and uh, I've submitted the resignation a number of times, including several times today. And uh, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, he's, he's uh, said, uh, we appreciate your, uh, your, your thoughts and uh, get back to work. <laughs> and so that's it. So when you're doing work for the Lord, man, you know, you're valuable to him. But at the same time, you're also a target for the enemy. So if you're feeling oppressed and you're feeling now, I was uh, looking at some of the comments on a YouTube video about the rapture. And the guy was like, man, the Lord is good. And it's interesting because this, this one particular YouTube video wasn't anti-rapture. And they were talking about the same things we've been talking about for the last three weeks. And one guy was saying, hey, it's, it's not actually the 71st year anniversary of Israel until May 14th. So we still it's have until May. Really so this guy was saying, and I'm talking not, not just the teacher, but the commentators, like regular lay wow. people yeah. know. Yeah. It's yeah. like the Holy Spirit is revealed to the real people, mm -hmm. the real followers who study their Bible. And somebody else said, yeah, and, and you know, we got, you know, no longer than 2021, which is what we had talked about for the last three weeks. And then somebody else said, it might even be sooner. The, the 71st year of Israel's anniversary doesn't begin until May 14th. Yeah. So we got until May 30th. We might be out of here before 2021. <laughs> it is almost word for word what we've been saying for the last three weeks. So I think that all just points out to me that we're not just whistling Dixie, but that the real body of Christ, the real church, the guys who really get together and study their Bible on Thursday night or Wednesday night at somebody's house, mm -hmm. that is the real church. And the Holy Spirit is revealing to us individually mm -hmm. that certain prophecies could be coming true that would get us out of here. And I think another hallmark of individuals who are really born again, who are really part of the cosmic corporate church of all time, not a building or a denomination, is that we hunger. And I was reading some of those YouTube comments and I, my heart went out to those people. I was like, because I could feel exactly what they, like they want. It's like, dude, I've got to get out of here. He's got to get me out of here. You know, I just can't take it anymore. You know, and these aren't people engaged in sin and in the world and whatever. These are people that have been like, man, I've been fighting hard and I came out of the world and I've just been keeping to the straight and narrow, but I'm getting tired, man. I'm getting worn out. I'm getting discouraged. I, I got to get out of here. You know, 2021 can't come fast enough right. and somebody else comes back and says, it might be some of that, brother. Hang yeah, in yeah. there. It might, you know, just, you know, May 14th, you know, we, we maybe quit time. And, and, you know, if not then, then before 24, mm -hmm. just hang in there. But I think if you're really a born and believer, the hallmark that sets, sets you apart from the rest of the world is your desire to go be with the Lord. What do you have here that you love so much that you would prefer to be here and share that here in the world than to go be with Jesus? Beautiful wife at home. Uh, Steve doesn't have that, so <laughs> neither do I. So, well, we don't have that one, right? Riches in our bank account, you know, offshore Swiss bank account with millions of dollars. Now, Steve and I don't have that. Genevieve, I never had. So I'm assuming that you don't either. Um, and so, so we don't have a lot of the trappings of the world that make people fall in love with the world. But when you look at some of the, I, I love to spend time looking at and analyzing the lives of the entertainment industry, hoi polloi, the rich oh. and famous, whether it be uh, R. Kelly, you know, I see him yeah. going through, he had his nervous breakdown on TV. I and, saw a of that. Oh, yeah. goodness for me. He made millions singing songs about sex and, and depredation and, 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 and all kinds of immoral things. And now he, the man's having a nervous breakdown. You look at the Kardashians and how rich and famous they've become. You look at Britney Spears, who's you know, practically mentally incompetent to, to handle her own affairs. You know, how she, she just quit her Vegas residency because she couldn't take it and said, oh, well, I had a death in the family or something like that. She had to go to somebody's funeral. So what, what really is happening is she realized she's a slave, which is what the title of one of her songs was, you know, a slave for you or something. You're a slave to that entertainment industry that gives you wealth and fame. It's really Satan using shiny baubles and you know pieces of polished glass to make you think like you're getting a deal. And we've heard from different rappers say, yeah, I made a deal with the devil and it was a bad deal. Yeah. You know, you make a deal with the devil and you're gonna come out and short into the state. Yeah. And so you see those guys and you see that 
money doesn't buy peace. Money doesn't buy happiness. And so it's exciting for us to know that we don't have any, and so we don't have to worry about it. And so we don't have any to distract us from the Lord. And we can keep our desire uh, and our purity uh, for, for being with Jesus intact. And that's one thing that we have that a lot of the rest of the world doesn't have. And a lot of the rest of the church or nominal church doesn't have. A lot of people who call themselves part of the church, you know, they got these mega church pastors who are pulling down seven figure salaries, over a million dollars a year. When, you know, Bob left Calvary Fort Lauderdale for, you know, reasons of adultery, he was pulling down well over a million dollars a year. And I'm like, how can a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ be getting a salary from the church of over a million dollars? It's because it's become a corporation, and corporations have to generate income to, in order to be, maintain profitability. And so we see that sort of thing going on in the nominal church world, and yet we find out that the gospel and the rapture and the rise of Antioch, those types of topics aren't really emphasized all that much in a lot of the commercial church world. And so I would, I would say to you that we are the ambassadors of Christ here on the earth. We are the remnant of the original apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ. We are the modern day iteration of the church that we see suffering persecution at the hands of people that hate God, that hate Jesus, and are killing people because they were friends. They killed James because he was a friend of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. So the book of Acts gives the story of the nascent growing early church and I think we and people like us all over the world that are meeting in homes so we're, we're here in a home you know meeting and sitting in folding chairs and talking about the Bible we got like I got two copies of the Bible you got two we got like eight nine different you know full King James Bible sitting around in a you know 20 square foot area because we know that the Word of God is what we base our relationship with Jesus on until he comes back, not men, not television ministries, and not, you know, YouTube. And so it's encouraging to see it. So we're going to look at, you know, after we found out the first two verses that King Herod Agrippa kills off James, just grabs him, kills him. It's shocking. James was such a big part of the Gospels. He's the brother of John, you know, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote the book of Revelation. You would think God would supernaturally prevent him from being killed, right? No, no. You don't see that. You don't see that because you're important in the eyes of the Lord that you don't suffer persecution. It seems like the guys who are important suffer more persecution than the guys who aren't important. If you're a baller, if you're, you're a special soldier for the Lord, you're going to be targeted by Satan. And the Lord will oftentimes allow Satan to put his hands on you and do terrible things to the glory of God. And eventually, Romans 8, 28, all things, including your persecution, will work out to the honor and glory of God. So, uh, Verse uh, 13, Genevieve, we're going to go now to the Last Supper. Remember, the Last Supper was Jesus' last get-together with his disciples the night prior to his arrest and crucifixion, um, hours before Jesus is actually paraded before uh, King Herod, who is the uncle of King Herod Ripple, who just put to death uh, James. And so Jesus makes a very important comment, chapter 15, Verse 13, very key. Yeah. Chapter 15, uh, verse 13. Yes. And after they had held peace, their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Okay. Steve, 15, verse, verse 13. John chapter 15, verse 13. Oh, John, I did ask. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did the same thing. <laughs> Which one did you got? I went to Acts 2, verse 1, man. Oh, okay. John 15, you got it. I got it. You want me to do it? There you go. Go ahead. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for its friends. Okay, see that? Greater love has no man than this. The man be willing to lay down his life for his friends. That's saying the greatest type of love that there is altogether is to do what? Lay down your life. You sacrifice your life for your friends. In other words, you value someone else's life over and above your own. 
that's the greatest form of love. And this isn't talking just about wives or husbands, you know, dying for their wives. This is one person dying for their friends. That's what Jesus showed us very shortly thereafter. And so death in the eyes of God isn't necessarily this horrible, terrible thing that shows that God disproves of you and he allowed you to die because he was angry at you because you're a sinner and a pagan or something like that. No. Love shows itself in self-sacrifice. And the ultimate self-sacrifice is to lay down your life so that someone else doesn't have to. Jesus did that. And then we find out later that James repays the favor by laying his life down for the benefit of the church. Now, Steve, if you would pop down to verse 18 and read the next three verses, verses 18 to 15. Same discourse here where Jesus is speaking to the disciples after having just told them that the greatest form of love is to lay down your life. Now he goes on to add, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world will love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember, word, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If, ye, if they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. So... Key takeaway there is, uh, what's that again, Steve? Read that comment. Mm -hmm. Sure. If the world hate you, uh, what, I'm sorry. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his, love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Wow. So he's saying to the disciples the night before the actual crucifixion, he's saying, look, the world's going to hate you after I'm gone. That Satan is the mastermind, the power behind the kingdom of the world. He's going to be after me, but he, I'll be outside of his reach. After they crucify me, they can't do anything more to me. When I rise from the dead, I'm going to heaven. And he won't, I won't be within his grasp anymore. So he's going to come after the children. He's going to come after you. And so Jesus is just advising them in advance. He says, the world's going to hate you. But remember, if, if the world hates you, you know it hated me first. And if you were of the world, the world would love you. Because the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, and I chose you out of the world, that's the reason the world hates you. That's why we have a much harder time in life than everybody else. That's why we don't get the breaks. It <laughs> seems like everybody else gets the breaks mm -hmm. except us, right? Why? Because Satan is behind the breaks. Satan causes breaks to be made for people in the Hollywood entertainment industry or the movie industry or the porn industry or the, you know, uh, multi-billion dollar real estate, you know, uh, banking mm -hmm. and industry world because he knows that through money and wealth and success and fame he can control men and by controlling their 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 wills and their spirits he can control their bodies and he can use do that most effectively through the use of money and finances and pleasure so jesus says to these guys who become the church after his resurrection he says you know i've chosen you out of the world so you're different. That's what the term church means. Mm -hmm. In Greek, it's ecclesia, the gathered together ones, the called out ones. Sanctified means to be set apart or called out from a group. You are a special set aside group that's gathered together, ecclesia, together. You've been sanctified, meaning that you're not speaking in tongues and falling over backwards, mm -hmm. but you're separated out. You are the set apart ones. And it's easy for the world to start with us because we're set apart. And then a special little group. And so it's like, oh, those, those guys are the only people in the whole world that are not part of the world. And so we get targeted. And so he says, remember, the servant is not greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they will definitely persecute you. And so that's another one of the promises Jesus makes to us. You're going to get persecution. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. 
you're going to get a chance to show the greatest form of love, which is to lay down your life for your friends. Now we go to my undergrad college life verse, Steve, John 16, verse 33. That's why I love the Gospel of John. And remember, this is the brother of John who just got killed by Herod Agrippa. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribul tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So he's saying you will have tribulation. He didn't say that the church is going to go through the great tribulation period. No, that's the 70th week of Daniel. He's not saying the church is going to go through the 70th week of Daniel. Because only a certain portion of people, only a certain portion of a generation of people will be alive during the seven-year period of time known as the great tribulation or the tribulation period and the great tribulation period. So this message isn't just for those few people that are alive during the 70th week of Daniel, he's given a message to the entire church for all time. He's saying, in the world you will have tribulation. But then he says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. How did he do that? By rising from the dead to cancel out the power of sin. He didn't say he's going to supernaturally stand in the gap and prevent you from ever suffering persecution or suffering harm or hurt at the hand of Satan and his, his cohorts. That's not what he's saying. He's not promising you TBN prosperity. He's not promising you T.D. Jakes and Paula White and, uh, you know, Joel Osteen, your best life now, and uh, your child of the king, start living like it right now and enjoying your wealth. Those things are being promoted by false, Luciferian, pseudo-Christian cultists who want you to believe that the pursuit of money is the most favorable and most important thing you could do in your walk in Christ. The reality is eschewing all those things and pursuing Christ himself is the most important thing. And those that pursue Christ are always forced directly into what? Evangelism. Evangelism. That's exactly, exactly how we please God. <clears throat> by taking the gospel and giving it to the people. That way, the people can be saved. And if we don't do that, then they can't be saved. And so then, you know, what's our purpose here on the world? To get married? have a great sex life with our wife, have a lot of money, uh, have a great retirement home, have great uh, retirement vacations planned for my wife and I, and go into exciting different exotic things and taking pictures and posting them on Facebook and Instagram, and then we die. You know, is that what we were called into the world? No. No. We were called into the world to be trained up for our eternal positions of leadership during the first thousand years of human history under Jesus Christ in the millennial reign, and then after that, throughout eternity, to reign and rule with Christ. We talked about that a few weeks ago. So, we look now at the period of time that we're in. We're in boot camp training, officers training corps. I was in that in undergrad. <clears throat> Zerg officer training corps. We taught us to fight, and shoot, repel, and do all kinds of military tactic things. And we're being trained for military tactician and leadership roles right now. We're all gonna be officers in the Lord's army. Some of us will have higher ranks than others because we were more faithful at training and more faithful at executing the things we learned in training. That's how, you know, just like in a military, you've got generals, lieutenants, colonels, privates, sergeants, different rankings, right, Timothy? Yes, and, and the different rankings are based upon, you know, how much you, you knew and how <coughs> faithful you were in calling out your, uh, you, you know, your duties, carry out your duties. Enlisted men could, could rise to the rank of sergeant, right? That's right. <clears throat> but to become an officer, you had to go and get further education. Yes, you had to go to officer training corps and, and get your, your college degree and all of that. And then you would be qualified to start out as a lieutenant, which is what they were going to commission me. And of course, offer me a, a second lieutenant commission, you know, once I finished law school. And, um, and I could have moved up the ranks, and then you could become a captain, and then you could become, you know, eventually maybe even a general, and then a first, you know, four star general, or corporal, or colonel, or whatever. All these different ranks are based upon experience and faithfulness in executing your duties as part of the army. We are part of the Lord's army, and our eventual ultimate ranking after we're done with all of our training will be based upon how faithful we were in learning the different things we need to learn and carrying out the orders that we were given to show whether or not we were responsible.
And so, you know, we all struggle with that. And I pray about it. I'm like, Lord, I just, uh, I suck, you know. Get me out of here before I lose all my rewards in heaven, <laughs> you know. Um, but the Lord is faithful. Now, you know, you got to do what you're told. Yeah. You, you, you have received your orders, and you are to carry them out until sure. further yeah. notice. Yeah. You have received your orders. Now, go forth and carry them out. So, I received my marching orders. Teach. And then go out and preach. I ran soft rank again today at the courthouse. Did I didn't get a chance to talk to him because I was in a rush, but it was great to see our, our buddy, Steve and I, uh, one of our street evangelism buddies, you know, he's got his own little ministry up and starts and he's in front of the courthouse and up in Broward almost like every day. And so he does he does his I mean, weekdays just like Steve and I do on South Beach on, on Saturdays. So, you know, he'll be there by himself sometimes and sometimes he'll get other people to gather around with him. And he's been faithful for years as we have as well. So again, the Lord has his people. We won't be on TV, but you know, we we stand out, we, we notice each other, we encourage one another. So so okay, <clears throat> so the takeaway then is that tribulation is coming to the whole church. So don't be expecting riches and rewards here on the earth. Expect persecution and maybe even martyrdom. Now we're gonna flip over, if you would Steve, I want you to give me um the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, or uh, Genevieve, if you, uh, who are, you want to get there first? Matthew 24, <clears throat> verses 3 through 9. Olivet Discourse gives us Jesus talking to his disciples and giving, and we, we talk about that, that passage almost every week, it seems like. And last week during the rapture study, we were talking about Olivet Discourse being the most important Bible prophecy seminar that Jesus ever gave. And so we'll see that he also touches upon this uh, persecution theme, uh, Matthew 24, verses 3 through 9. Yes, and as he sat upon the mountain of the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And shall and what shall be the signs of the, thy coming? and of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be family, family, families, Fam uh, famines and pestilence, and earthquakes and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow, sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated, of all nations for my name's sake. So will we see then that one of the signs that Jesus is giving of what we had talked about the second coming of Christ, which would be preceded by seven years by the rapture. Jesus says in Matthew 24, look for these signs and you'll know that my second coming and the rapture is coming very shortly. And one of the signs that he says, in addition to nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines and pestilences and earthquakes and diverse places, are the beginning of sorrows. He says, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated for all, by all nations for my name's sake. Jesus is saying one of the signs of his ultimate return for the church at the rapture and return to the earth with the church at the second coming is the persecution of the followers of Jesus Christ. The church prior to the rapture, the tribulation saints after the rapture. And he says, you are going to be afflicted and you'll be delivered up. And after being delivered up to be afflicted, they shall kill you and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. In other words, the followers of Jesus Christ are going to be hated by every nation on the face of the earth. And that must include the United States since the United States is part of every nation. So we're seeing with each passing day, it's getting harder and harder to be a Christian here in the United States. There's always some new abortion law coming out, making abortion easier and making church rights more limited and making it a crime to say, you know, certain things in the Bible, like homosexuality is a sin, you know, 
But if you are in England and you're a Muslim, you can say pretty much whatever you want. But if you're in England and you say things like, God says homosexuality is an abomination, you can get arrested and go to jail. So the nations of the world have always hated Jesus, but one of the signs of his approaching second coming is the increasing hatred and persecution of the church for following after Jesus. And it's kind of a scary thing when you look at it. Jesus is saying, you know, the other discourse. Not only are you going to have earthquakes, we have that crazy weather patterns. We had tornadoes this past weekend that killed a ton of people. Uh, wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, ethnic group against ethnic group. Also, at the same time, you're going to also see persecution of the church being handed up for affliction and martyrdom and being hated by every nation on earth. And Christianity is, is pretty much that universal religion where, you know, the Muslims are against us, Hindu, Buddhist, you know, Christianity, biblical Christianity is so narrowly focused that it's impossible to be syncretized into any other religious belief system or any other governmental system. And so everybody is against us. And that's how the Bible says it would be just before Jesus comes back. And we're seeing that happen now. And we should be expecting it to happen with increasing frequency as we get closer to the rapture of the church, followed by the second coming of Jesus seven years later. So, speaking of which, uh, let's jump over to the last book of the Bible, Steve, and let's take a look at Revelation chapter 7. And we'll see um, a follow-up of, of that, that message that Jesus is giving to the disciples who will become part of the church. Uh, after the resurrection, and we'll see after the church is gone, the tribulation saints that go through the 70th week of Daniel face the same terrible opposition that we, the church, face now, even more so. Verses 13 through 17, Steve, Revelation 7. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are, the, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living found fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So, um, we see that the tribulation saints, they get martyred, you know, go and gather themselves beneath the throne of God in heaven. And John has shown these individuals in Revelation chapter 7, and the angel says to them, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence come they? And John says, Sir, thou knowest, you're a smart guy. Just like same passing the buck uh, our friend Ezekiel did. He said, Can these bones live again, Ezekiel? <laughs> oh Lord, thou knowest. I'm not gonna hazard a no guess. Way. I won't be found wrong. Uh, you know, so you'll tell us. And so John kind of does the same thing. He kind of just sits back and, and says, Man, you know. Sir, you know us. You work here. I'm, I'm just a visitor. And then the angel said, These are they which came out of great tribulation. That's where we get the term great tribulation period. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's a paradox, you know. Usually washing your robe to make it white, you wouldn't want to do it with white robes and blood. And that wouldn't make them white, but the blood of the Lamb cleanses whiter than any bleach. And it says, Therefore they are before the throne of God, day and night in his temple. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and lead them and guide them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And so we see that the people that are trapped here on the earth, the followers of Christ, were rejected. The sun beat down on them, and the world rejected them, and they were persecuted. They were tired, and when they got to the heaven because their physical bodies had been killed, they were happy. They were at rest, and you know now they've been given white robes to wear, which is the righteousness of Jesus, 
because they became followers of Jesus Christ, so they were clothed in Jesus' righteousness. And, you know, they were crying tears because they were tired, because they were weary, because they were downtrodden. But it says in verse 17 that the Lamb was in the midst of the throne. Now he feeds them and leads them. And God himself will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. They won't be crying anymore because now they have no reason to cry. <clears throat> they've washed the robe and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They've come out of the Great Tribulation period. <clears throat> but to do that, they had to be put to death. They lost their lives, but they gained <clears throat> eternal life, which is much more valuable. Now, Jacob, if you would, let's go back to the Last Supper, John chapter 16, where, uh, you know, remember the Last Supper started in John chapter 13 and ran all the way through John chapter 17. And so we see in John chapter 16, Jesus again is revealing dark times coming for the church. And we are that church that are experiencing those dark times. And so we have to be ready for that. And so, uh, verses 1 through 4. These things have I spoken unto you, that yet should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yeah, the time comes that whosoever killed you will think that he does God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember, may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said un, not unto you, at the beginning, because I was with you. All right, so Jesus is saying now, hey, we're at the end of the road. This is our last get-together before I go back to my father's house. And he's saying, I didn't tell you a lot of the hard truths that were to come because it was the beginning and I was still with you. But now I'm getting ready to depart. And so now <clears throat> I'm going to be leaving you, so I'm going to tell you all of the truth, the whole truth. And he says, these things I've spoken unto you that should not be offended in other words, he didn't want us to be caught off guard. He didn't want us to be caught by surprise and, uh, you know, cause to stumble later. So he says, this is the hard truth that I, I, I didn't want to tell you three years ago, but they are going to put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. What? That's exactly what we see. With the religious elite in Israel, we see King King Herod, you know, trying to please the people, and you see Saul trying to please God by killing Stephen the martyr. It says the time is coming, and almost is here, and whoever kills you will think that he's doing God a service, and these things they will do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So falsely placed religious zealotry will cause the church members to be put to death even by those who claim to be followers of God. And so Jesus goes on to say, but these things I've told you that when the time shall come, you remember that I told you of them. And these are the things that I said not to you at the beginning because I was with you then. So he's saying, yeah, these are the hard truths that i got to share with you now. And I'm telling you this now, 2,000 years early, so that when it does happen, when it happens two months from now with Stephen the Martyr, when it happens... 2,000 years from now, with Stephen heard on South Beach, you know, you're not going to be shocked. You're not going to be like, oh my gosh, the Lord must have abandoned us. Because otherwise, why would he let us be persecuted? Because Joel Osteen told us we're supposed to have our best life now. If we're having our worst life now, that must be because God doesn't approve of us like he does Benny Hinn and TBN and Joel Osteen. No, it's because you are being persecuted by the God of this world, Satan. And Jesus told us in advance, persecution is coming to you. And that the time is coming that whosoever puts you to death <coughs> will think that he's doing God a favor. <coughs> In other words, can you imagine that? Killing the servant of God and thinking that you are making God happy by killing off one of his, his most beloved and faithful servants. But we see that in scriptures time and again. And we'll, we'll take the time to look, if you would, Steve. Acts chapter 7. Start us at verse 51 and have you run all the way through to Acts chapter 8, verse 4. So start at verse, uh, verse 51 of Acts 7 and then run through the first four verses of the following chapter. 
ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now, the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dis disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and, and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And then he had, and then he had said this, he fell asleep. So, and Saul... Said, uh, and when he had said this... And when he had said this, I'm sorry. And when he had said this... He fell asleep. Asleep. We, we learned that asleep again is a you've missed death, before. Death, death. And so what happens next? And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution <clears throat> against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all cast, scattered, were abroad. All scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and made great lamentation over him. As for Paul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every home, every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So all we see then is that Stephen the martyr, man, he gives a great sermon, and the people of Israel turn against him, stone him to death, while Saul watches over their clothing and gives instructions on how to kill him. And Saul was consenting unto his death, it says, <clears throat> and began a great persecution. Paul the apostle, the future apostle, began a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, to the extent that they all were scattered and had to flee not only Jerusalem, the city, but Judea, the province, and Samaria. And they had to go into Syria. And <clears throat> they eventually had to go into Asia to escape the wrath of Saul and the temple religious zealots who hated Jesus and the followers of Jesus. And it says, and Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women and committing them to prison. And they all scattered abroad. He was arresting men, women, and children and putting them in jail and getting ready to try to have them killed. So rabid was his anger and wrath against the followers of Jesus. This is the church that we're a part of now. If it happened then, it'll happen again, the Bible says. And Jesus is telling us this in, in, in advance during the Last Supper because he didn't want us to be caught off guard. And so he told us, and then it started coming to pass with Stephen. And then we see that it came to pass again tonight. We look, and it, it came to John's brother, James. So you got Stephen the martyr, then James falls early in, in, you know, by Acts chapter 12, James is dead too, you know, the, 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 the bosom buddy, son of boy energies, you know, of Jesus, you know, John and James, and James is now a dead man, an important part of the church, killed by the whim of a false king, just because he wanted to harass the church. So the same Satan that was behind Harry Agrippa in the murder of James, is the same Satan that's behind persecuting us today, making our lives very, very difficult. So now we'll pick it back up in Acts chapter uh, seven, uh, excuse me, twelve, verses three through five. Here we Three to five. Yeah. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. 
And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Okay, so what we see then, Herod Agrippa, after killing James, the brother of John, the writer of the Gospel, John, and the book of Revelation, saw that the people were pleased. He was like, hey, this is a popular thing. All right, let me let me get the other guy. So you, you got one of the leaders of the church, because remember, you know, uh, you know, Paul is still some new guy, and he's gotten converted. And now he's off and hiding in Damascus because they're trying to kill him from, for converting. And so basically, the head of the church is James and John and Peter, and James is dead, and now they snatch up Peter, who's the other head guy in charge, and they're planning to kill him too. Why? Because he said. Well, killing James got me such popularity and, and acclaim of the people, I'm going to kill off Peter too. So Peter is arrested, and he's guarded by four quaternions of soldiers. And that's, you know, that's a whole lot. And so, um, you know, they, they intended to have him killed the very next day. And so that, that's a problem for Peter. Um, but we see that God intervenes and... We then find out that uh, God will cause a certain thing to occur. So Peter's put in prison, and he is now guarded by a ton of soldiers, planning four quaternions, and um, so so you got four different squads of soldiers who are now, you know, guarding and not just four soldiers, but four different squads or teams of soldiers who are, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, in enlisted in keeping this man alive until morning so we can kill him in front of the crowd so the people can cheer for it. For me, can hear it even more. But we find out that uh, God supernaturally intervenes and we find out that God himself is going to answer the prayers of the church. The church is meeting over at John Mark's mother's house and that's where the church was meeting in people's homes. And they were praying up to God after he was apprehended and had all these soldiers, you know, to, to you know, basically to guard him. And it says, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him unto four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after what? Easter, to bring him forth to the people. Now, in the New King James and in the NIV and NASB, they put Passover here. They say, well, Passover is, you know, the Jewish feast of unleavened bread and whatever. But no, the King James is actually accurate here. Easter, despite what your notes and comments will say, is the pagan springtime festival. Mm -hmm. King Herod Agrippa isn't a Christian, and he isn't, you know, keeping the Ten Commandments. He's not concerned about the Passover and unleavened bread. He's concerned about all the people. And the pagan feast of Ishtar, also known in the English language as Easter, was also at the same time as the Feast of Unleavened Bread of the Passover. So again, if somebody said, oh, the King James Version is wrong because it translates the word Easter here and it's supposed to be uh, Passover. No, it's actually supposed to be Easter because it's making reference to the fact that the pagans were celebrating the Feast of Ishtar, which was a springtime fertility festival. And it was after that that they were going to bring Peter to the people and kill him. It says, therefore, Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing by the church unto God for him. And if you would, um, real quick, Steve, we'll, we'll find out that God will supernaturally intervene. Um, and, and basically, uh, we'll spare Peter. And it's a miracle. And take a look and see, but... but We'll see that it's a temporary respite. Read for us verses 6 through 10 and see how God supernaturally intervened here and prevented Peter's execution. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. And raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell from his, from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment upon thee, and follow me. 
And he went and he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true that was done by the angel, but though but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which openeth to them his own accord, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through our street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. All right, so God supernaturally spares Peter's life and gets him out. And so you might question yourself, like, well, wait, did God like Peter more than he liked James? Why did James get supernaturally, you know, delivered? Well, because Peter had a ministry that was specifically to take the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, after he saw the blankets come down, he was told that you can't consider Gentiles unclean. Peter, who was the visual head of the church, was uh, needed for God to make an example to other Jews who were followers of Jesus that it was okay to admit Gentiles into the church. And then eventually he gave Paul leadership over that entire ministry to the Gentiles. But we see that though Peter was supernaturally saved from execution in Acts chapter 12, um, he was going to die that morning and wouldn't have fulfilled all the work that the Lord had for him to do. We see that eventually Satan does ask for and receive the life of Peter. And we know that that was predicted in advance. Um, Peter's life is only temporarily spared. He's rescued from death, uh, you know, within certain death, within hours, only to be allowed to promote the gospel to the Gentiles and then eventually take it to Babylon and take it to Rome. But eventually, when he gets to the city of Rome, he's put to death. He's crucified upside down outside the city of Rome. And, uh, you know, it's sad because Peter and Paul both met their demise there. But we see that even in the Gospel of John, if we look at John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, we see that Jesus himself had predicted to Peter that he was going to die. So, yeah, he gets supernaturally saved from death in Acts chapter 12, but before Joel Osteen tells you, see that proves you're supposed to have your best life now. No, it's a temporary reprieve because Jesus said in one of his last addresses to the disciples after the resurrection prior to the ascension, John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19, Jesus says, uh, goes on to say, so when they had died, Jesus appeared to the disciples up in Galilee to prove who he was again. Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto them, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Be my lambs. And he saith unto him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Be my sheep. And he saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved. He was like, The Lord is busting on me, are you? Are you, are you, are you clowning on me? He was like, <laughs> Because he said unto him, the third time lovest thou me. And he said unto him, Lord, look, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest well that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, be my sheep. Peter denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus is giving Peter a chance to affirm his love for him three times to reconcile himself. And then Jesus goes on to add this cryptically, just out of the blue. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, Thou girdest thyself, and thou walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. What was he talking about? Well, just in case you were wondering, we find out in the very next verse, verse 19, he says, This Jesus spake, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. So wait a minute, verse 19 is saying that Jesus is doing all this descriptive stuff to tell Peter, you're going to be crucified to glorify God. He's telling Peter, you're going to stretch forth your hands and be led where you don't want to go, to the cross. And he says, Jesus spoke this to Peter, signifying by what death 
Peter will glorify God. Wow, that's a big deal, man. That's a big deal. That's, that's the right-hand man, Peter, being told even then, you're eventually going to die. You're going to die by a terrible means of crucifixion. So, again, the most important guys in the church, you got James, you got Stephen, now you got Peter. Eventually you'll get Paul getting his head cut off as well. The key guys in the church are the guys being put to death. Why? Because God hates them or they didn't fulfill the ministry? No, because God knows that your physical life is meaningless. Your physical life is only useful to the extent that you allow it to be used by God to accomplish certain things. And that if you're a major impact player for God, you should expect tribulation, you should expect persecution, and in many cases you can expect martyrdom, death. So, again, that point is underscored without question in these verses. Now, we get on to verse 11, Genevieve, uh, Acts chapter 12. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Aaron and from all the expectations of people of the Jews. Jews. So we see then in uh, verse 11, it says, and when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of the parrot and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. What expectation was that? That he was going to be killed. The people were all consenting unto the death of Peter. And, you know, Peter had been supernaturally released, as we found out from Steve. And the old angel of the Lord came upon him, hit Peter on the side, made him get up, and walked him right out of the prison. And he went out and followed him, and, you know, he, he thought he saw a vision, and then he woke up, and he was like, man, wait a minute, I actually, I thought I was having a dream that I got delivered from the prison, but it actually happened. And so, you know, Jesus uh, sent his angel to rescue Peter, but it's only temporary because eventually the Jewish elite would get their desires, and Peter would be eventually crucified by the Romans. Um, uh, many years later when Peter was an older man outside the city of uh, uh, Rome. And so verse 12, Steve. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Okay, so what we see then is that the church isn't meeting in a synagogue. The church isn't meeting in a temple church isn't meeting at the Compact Center in Houston, Texas. The church isn't meeting in some big American Airlines type arena where you pay $110 per seat to get in. They are meeting at somebody's house. That's where the church met. And the person who had the biggest house in this case was the mother of John Mark. John Mark is the cousin of Barnabas, who's the guy that brought Paul into fellowship in the church and who accompanied Paul on his first missionary journey. It was Barnabas, Paul, and John Mark. And it was the same John Mark whose mother is hosting this prayer meeting for Peter. The same John Mark lost his nerve halfway through the first missionary journey. He said, I want my mommy. This is too tough for me. They're trying to hurt us and kill us. And John Mark ran home crying to his mommy. And Paul got so angry, he said, never again will that boy go out with us. And so when it was time for the second missionary journey to start, Barnabas said, we're going to bring my nephew, you know, John Mark. And Paul was like, oh, oh no, we saw how he, Barnabas, you know, I understand family, but you know, you saw how he caved under pressure and ran home crying to his mom with his tail between his legs. No way, we're not taking him on a second missionary journey. We need real men of God out there willing to fight and lay down their lives for the gospel. And Barnabas was like, and Paul, he is my sister's, you know, youngest brother, you know, son, you know, I can't do it. I can't leave him behind. He's got to come with us. And Paul was like, nope. And we go our separate ways. And sadly, it was John Mark's sort of, uh, I guess, rookie and experience, you know, tim timidity and inability to, to carry the ball that caused the, the ministry of Barnabas and Paul to come to an end. And as a result of that, Barnabas took Mark out on the gospel uh, evangelism trips, and uh, Paul joined up with a new guy, uh, Silas, as his new evangelism partner, eventually. Barnabas was martyred as well. So, you know, all the key guys, Barnabas, you know, breaks up with Paul and goes out with Mark and gets himself killed evangelizing. 
and eventually Mark matures, John Mark matures, and Paul tells Timothy, make sure that you bring Timothy with you when you come to visit me before I die in Rome, because you know, Timothy, you know, John Mark is, is beneficial to me in the ministry. Remember, so he's, a, yeah. he's reconciled, a tribute back right? To At the very end, Paul shows that it's all good. We were all growing in the Lord, and we were all new to the faith, and we were all doing the best we could. And at the end, John Mark grew up and became a man of, of faith and power. And, and Paul, just before he died, said, make sure you bring with you John Mark, because he's beneficial to me in the ministry. And so he got the pass off leadership mantle to Timothy, Titus, and to John Mark, who eventually would write the second gospel, the gospel of Mark. Uh, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark, the gospel, is written by this kid who bailed out because he was a coward during the first missionary journey and who caused a rift between Barnabas and Paul and their street evangelism team. So that's just a historical aside mm -hmm. thrown in there at, at, um, it's at, at, cool. at no cost. <laughs> Cost. So, yep, John Mark, cousin, I think, of Barnabas, as most mm -hmm. nephew. Um, so now, Genevieve, let's, uh, let's go ahead and finish up the chapter, verses 13 through 16. Yes, and as Peter knocked at, at the door of the, of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when, he, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened up the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is angel. It is what? It, 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 it is his angel. Okay. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Okay, so what we see then is that you know Peter gets rescued from certain death by the angel, and he goes to the place where the church is meeting, which is at the house of John Mark's mother. And he's banging on the door, and the servant named Rhoda opens the door. So, like, oh my gosh, it's Peter! And she doesn't even open the door. She runs back to tell everybody, "Guess who's at the door? It's Peter!" And they're like, "Woman, you've lost your mind. He's dead. You know, Harry uh, Agrippa killed James." What makes you think he wouldn't kill Peter too? He's no, I just saw him. He's at the door. And while they're arguing about it, Peter's banging on the door. And they were like, he's there. And then somebody's like, oh my gosh, it's it's, it's Peter's ghost, you know, it's, it's come back to, to haunt us or whatever. And so we see that they're so excited that they, that the glory of the Lord had saved Peter that they kind of sort of left him out there. And then, you know, uh, verse 17 says, you know, but but he, Peter, beckoning unto them with the hand uh, to hold their peace, declared unto them how that the Lord had brought him out of prison and said, Go show these things unto James and unto the brethren. And he departed and went unto another place. And so you got James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was also one of the heads of the church, who's still alive. So you got this other James that he's supposed to show himself to since James, the brother of John, is already dead. And so Peter gives glory to God um, as, as a result of his supernatural rescuing. And then after he told him, hey, I'm alive, he, he headed out to another place. Because remember, he's a wanted man now. And what we're going to see is Steve's going to tell us in verse 18 and 19, uh, Herod Agrippa was not pleased that Peter supernaturally got away. And he wasn't attributed, well, it was an act of God. And, you know, don't blame me. Don't blame the Quaternians or the soldiers. Blame God. God let him out. That's not how Herod Agrippa saw it. Verses 8, 18 and 19, Steve. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers, but was become a Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. Wow. <laughs> That's a role. He, he took that pretty seriously. <laughs> he, he didn't take the failure of the prison guards to keep their assigned inmate. He didn't take it too well. He was like, okay, let me question you. So now what happened again? Mm -hmm. We locked him up, I swear. And we were up all night. And sure enough, you know, next thing you know, we looked around and he was gone. And the chains were empty there. 
And you're sure you didn't go to sleep, yeah. you didn't get drunk, you didn't whatever. It's like, all right, off of their heads. He kills them all. All the soldiers that were guarding Peter were put to death. Man, that shows you the angst that Peter, had, you know, Herod had against Peter. This, you know, sometimes we read the Bible and we think of it as like a, a fairy tale book of, of happy tales mm -hmm. for children and Jesus loves you, this I know, but the Bible tells me so, and be nice to your neighbors and whatever. The Bible is filled with graphic, horrible, terrible, scary things. Like this guy who was the political leader of this area was so determined to murder Peter simply because he was a follower of Jesus and he thought it might get him some political currency with the people that when he couldn't kill Peter, he killed a boatload of his yeah. most faithful servants and soldiers just because of his rage against Peter was so great. This is satanic rage. You can see that Satan was clearly trying to wipe out the church. And God intervenes and wouldn't let Satan bring it into the church before it could get up and run. Eventually, God allowed Peter to be handed over to Satan and he was crucified. But not till God fulfilled Peter's purpose. And there was a purpose in Peter's life, just as there was a purpose in Peter's death, which was to glorify God. Set an example for me. When I get discouraged after having a day like today and being angry, I'm like, I quit. You know, get me out of here. But look at Peter, though. You know, you're having a bad day. He had his worst day. That dude got crucified. Nobody's crucifying you yet. So until that happens, continue on. And so then it kind of gives me the mindset, wow, they killed James and they killed Peter. Wow, okay, so I guess I, you know, who am I to complain? You know, life gets to be tough sometimes, but it ain't that tough. And so... Herod kills off the guards who were responsible for uh, guarding Peter. And eventually, now we're going to get to verse 20 to 23. Steve, I call this portion, Vengeance of mine, saith the Lord. This King Herod Agrippa, just like his grandfather who preceded him, remember uh, King Herod killed all those kids while he was trying to kill baby Jesus. He fell over and got eaten up with worms, right? Remember that? He like, fell over and got sick and, oh, you know... Uh, and he died. He died a terrible death. And it turns out the same thing happens to his grandson, Herod Agrippa. And so we pick up in verse 20 through 23, Steve. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave back God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and given up the ghost. And gave up the ghost. Wow. So God got him. Man. Like, that was great. I loved it. Vengeance of mine, said the Lord. And he was like, look, it says, and, you know, the people gave a great shout. It's the voice of a God and not a man. And he was like, yes, I am a God. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten up worms and gave up the ghost and died a horrible and terrible death. And we find out that the word of God grew and multiplied. But we, we look back and we'll look at what happened with his grandfather. And it says... Um, just looking back, Matthew chapter 2, I'll just jump back there. Um, you know, uh, it, we get to the story of the, the wise men, Herod, you know, trying to find out why are these wise men here and what's going on. And so it, it turns out that in chapter 2, you know, when they see the star, you know, in verse 13 it says, And when they were departed, the wise men, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod, Herod the Great, the grandfather of the guy that just got eaten by worms, will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And there he was until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken of the Lord, the prophet saying, Out of Egypt I've called my servant. And then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all of the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time 
which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. And then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they were no more. And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. So, eventually, God gets revenge on those who are against them. Let's pick up uh, Romans chapter 12, Steve, if you would, uh, verses 14 to 21. It's a verse that talks about forgiveness, but it also happily lays out the proofs of the vengeance of God and how he will fight our battles for us. We don't need to go out and get uh, vengeance against our enemies that persecute us, so James' brother John didn't have to go out and, oh, I'm going to kill King Herod because I killed my brother. God took care of King Herod by having him eaten of worms. And so, you know, Peter's wife doesn't have to hire an assassin to take care of Caesar who killed Peter because God eventually will take care of those who do harm to his servants. It's not our job to do it. Our job is to forget and love and move forward with the gospel. And it's God's judgment, you know, job to judge those who persecute us. Romans chapter 12, verse 14, 21. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one, to, one toward another. Mind not high things, but con, condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if my enemy, if my enemy hunger, feed him. If he if he Thirst, give him drink, for in no doing thou shalt heap, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So, to take away their vengeance of mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So we don't have to fight our own battles. We don't have to worry about getting vengeance on those who are against us. The Lord himself will do that. It says, therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. Uh, if you thirst, give them drink. So in so doing, in other words, doing good to those who do evil, you, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. What's he talking about? Well, at the lake of fire, the more evil you do to the innocent, the more God's going to recompense you by deepening your punishment in the lake of fire. And again, that's another verse that supports the idea that there will be levels of torment in the lake of fire. It'll all be torment, but there'll be different levels of it. More intense for people that did even more evil. More intense for those that killed the followers of Jesus Christ as opposed to those who just rejected Jesus and didn't accept him as the Lord and Savior. So we'll finish up now, verse 24 and 25 going to be of Acts 12, and that will be enough uh, for tonight. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And so we see there, after the supernatural miraculous saving of Peter, God kills off Herod Agrippa to keep Herod from killing off Peter, which would interfere with God's plan for the spreading of the gospel of the Gentiles. In the meantime, God gathers together Barnabas and Paul, who's come out of hiding and, you know, teamed up with Barnabas. And, you know, they, they returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry abroad. And then they were going to go out on their, their first complete missionary journey. And it points out they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. This is the son of the woman who was hosting the prayer meeting for Peter in the church. And this is the first missionary journey where Paul... Uh, John, Mark, and Barnabas go out together. And so we saw 
Peter is supernaturally saved for a momentary period of time, and he's allowed to live another day to preach the gospel. Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark, they get together, and what do they do? Build a mega church? Oh. Start selling Christian books and tapes and Bible prophecy uh, DVDs? No. They get ready to go march down to Asia Minor and face the pagans and the Satanists and the Luciferians to the point that John Mark, in fear for his life, fled back home. And so the message is, we're going to be persecuted in the world. In the world, you will have tribulation, Jesus says, John chapter 16, verse 33. But be of good courage, because I, Jesus, have overcome the world. And that's what I would encourage you guys with. Tribulation's coming. It's already here. Hang in there, fight. The fighting is almost over. We don't want to give up and lay down our weapons. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual, mighty through God, to pulling down strongholds. Stay firm. Fight. Don't give up yet, Steve. Don't give up yet, Genevieve. Don't give up yet, Bernadette. Don't give up, give up yet, uh, you know, into the land, people. Don't give up. Stand tall and fight. And expect tribulation and persecution to come into your life. The more effective you are for Christ, the more persecution and opposition you should be getting from the heavenly spiritual places. And you might get it through your boss at, at your job. You might get it through circumstances during your day-to-day -day life, but you should be getting some opposition, some demonic oppression against you if you're being effective for Jesus, because such is the activity of the prince of the power of the air, who hates and opposes the servants of Jesus Christ. So, just be reminded, Jesus warned us 2,000 years ago, at the Last Supper, he told his very own disciples, in this world you will have tribulation. Not that you're going to go through the great tribulation period of the 70th of Daniel, the wrath of God. No, no. You're going to have tribulation from Satan right now before the great tribulation. Christians in China are being put to death. Christians in Islamic countries are being put to death. Christians here in America are being marginalized by the day, ostracized and pushed out of society. And our lives are getting more and more difficult with each passing day. Tribulation has already come to the church and it has been coming to the church since Stephen was martyred 2,000 years ago. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be a good cheer, because I have overcome the world. And so with that, we pray, come quickly, Jesus. We want to get out of here, man. <laughs> and I can just feel the weariness of the real church. And it just gives me the sense that unlike any other time since I've been alive, that the coming of the Lord Jesus would be perfect at this moment. Oh, it just seems to be at hand. It seems like he's letting us stretch ourselves to the nth degree just before we break. We bend but don't break. We're right at the breaking point. The church is so much false opposition, false Christianity and demonic opposition to us. And certainly now would be an excellent time for the Lord Jesus to come. I expect him any day now, and if not any day, any month now. If not any month, very soon, shortly after that. So let's stay firm in the faith and uh, expect it. And don't don't get a little weary, but yeah. don't get so weary that you give up. Steve's got a cold and sick, and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm struggling with one thing. I'm like, because oh, no. I'm not sleeping in four or five hours oh, yeah, uh, yeah. sleep at night. It's just, you know, we're putting in work, but that's what we're supposed to do. But we're going to have something to show for when we get to the Father's house in heaven after the rapture. So hang in there, maybe just for a few more days, and we'll get to go home and rest. All the tears we wiped away. Jimmy, we'll have a good time then. We're gonna, we're gonna laugh it out. It hurt. It was so much more lighthearted and happy and go friendly. I'm trying to be happy, guy. Wait till we get to the father's house. I'll be a happy camper. Wait till you get a load of me then. You don't really know my personality then. So, with that, Jimmy closes up. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for this beautiful gathering, and for those that are listening in the internet where they are also getting the fruit of your word so that we can be ready for the ending of this terrible world and getting prepared for the rapture. Please come, Jesus, as mm -hmm. soon as you can. Just mm -hmm. come on and rescue us from this evil world and give us the strength to use your word to save others. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask, and thank you for the word today. Amen. It's a wonderful prayer, Jimmy. That's awesome. It was. I'll get it better. A plus, man. <laughs>